Welcome back to the channel. I'm your host for today, Claire Headley, and this is my next episode in my series, Scientology Stories. No matter how you heard about Scientology, we appreciate you being here. Uh, this is our effort to educate people on the abusive practices as well as the language of Scientology while also sharing stories. And believe you me, Scientology does not want you to hear these. My guest for today is my friend, Dylan Gill. Welcome back, Dylan. Hello. Hello, hello. So in our last episode, we did, um, we were talking about your experiences with Shelly Miscavige. Um, right. You, yes. And um, and when we, you and I were talking, we figured we'd just wrap up the 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 last parts of your story that involves Shelly, but also more so talk, talk about your um, experience getting out of Scientology and what happened with all that. Um, so, so I'll give you the floor and let you take it away. How about that? Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, being in the Sea Org during that turnover period in the, in the 1980s, um, I, I think, one of the things with with David Miscavige and Shelley to kind of close the door on that sort of um, is you didn't know like you were doing that bidding and actually recently in in some of the live chats and other thing I've heard it referred to as like Miscavige's messengers mm -hmm. and I'd never thought of it that way. Um, but there are, were a lot of things that were implemented um, like the time machines. Um, and stuff like that. Is that me? That's crazy. Um, I never get phone calls. But <laughs> um, yeah, the time machines and, and like, you know, the way the internal communication um, had been was being updated. They were doing a, a large project at the time called Source Information Retrieval. Right. Um, and, and that was all um, really geared towards, you know, changing management to how they knew how to manage maybe not necessarily policy but how they as a as a duo at that time and, and as that later changed um but as that you know being on that that level um we had a lot of a lot of interactions um that weren't physical that weren't face to face they were you know written they were and most all cmo units had that cuz at the time, we weren't even shown how big each other were. Like, you didn't know how big CMO UK, like in the United Kingdom was, or mm. East US, or even PAC. Like, I assumed gold was huge. Right. And from my understanding, there was most of the time it was like four or five people. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and CMO CW in Clearwater was the biggest CMO unit, like most of the time. Yes. And so it was a whole different beast. And the whole fact that flag. Um, and the Florida base was always kind of a little bit different. Mm. Like it was always because it was the um, self-proclaimed Mecca of technical perfection. That was also kind of embraced on the administrative side. Yes. So the way that man. And so that's sort of um, and prior just prior to that, and unbeknownst to anybody who came after the flag land base, the FLB was like where a lot of stuff was. It was like the original flag command bureau almost. Yes. So it, and it had changed. So it's, you know, they were, and Shelly was intricately involved with all that while Dave was, you know, becoming this, like, I just bark orders and people do them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thing. So, True. Um, but yeah, the last um, few interactions that I did have with Shelly was after the decks um, out at Happy Valley. Um, I was assigned to the RPF's RPF. And um, after I got through the RPF's RPF program, I was on the RPF. But I was still segregated, um, probably because I had come from CST and anything I could say at the time. You know, I, I'm not really sure, but... Um, yeah. They were reprogramming so you in complete isolation, basically. Right, Probably exactly. because they didn't Start want checking. anyone to know where CST was located. Because even though you're at a confidential location, you came from a different confidential location. That would be my guess. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and at the time, that was a big, huge security thing. I, I understand yeah. later that that changed. Um, but not, um, not a huge amount, though. It still wasn't common knowledge, even to staff 
at the gold base in, in Gilman Hot Springs. Oh, okay. There were, yes, there were a handful more people like security and a few people here and there that would go to that running springs property but it definitely was never common knowledge as to where wow. that was located and i would imagine that most anybody that actually started going there would have started going there after they got their tax exemption correct because yes. prior to that the whole time i was there there was no interaction that way nobody right. from the int base came to cst at all yes um yeah and for example we there, there was in there, so. <laughs> yeah no for example there was one instance where there was a fire at um running springs property so i was and right. this was when i was in religious technology center i was supposed to go there to inspect and see what was happening or something like that Oh, and wow. they were preparing all this non-disclosure agreement paperwork for me to sign. And then right, at the last right, minute, right. I something else came up and I I didn't end up going. So I never signed that paperwork right, and I never went there. <laughs> right. No, that's I signed all that stuff. Yeah. Um that was definitely intense at the time. Um, but so either way, I was on the RPF and we were finishing up the studios up at Gold. Yeah. The actual recording studios. Um, and so we we're doing like finished trim and stuff like that. And every, I don't know, week or so, David Miscavige would bop in somehow and, you know, chat up the RPF or like, what are you here for or this or that? Um, and bark a couple orders or look at, or look around. Cause if you're in the space that he came in with his entourage, which usually included Shelly and, and then whatever appropriate terminal for where he was looking, like so CO Sumo Gold or the ops chief gold or something would be with him if he was checking out gold stuff. And if he was checking out other crap, he'd be with whoever. Um yeah. and so there was a few times where we had interactions that way. Um, but other than that, um that was about it. Once you kind of got put where you were gonna be, you were sort of dismissed. It was sort of, you know, the end of the end. So yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, agreed. <laughs> and so well, people um, would disappear all the time, you know, so yeah. they would disappear down to pack. And that was a big time when a lot of people were, you know, Happy Valley was kind of starting to be changed into the Int Ranch. So a lot of the RPF was being sent down to uh, pack or to LA. Um, I guess some might have gone to flag, but anybody they could salvage, they kind of saw, and everybody else they were dumping. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of, you know, and we just built stuff on the RPF. <laughs> That's all yeah. we did. And so during this time that you were on the rehabilitation project force, wh where was Bronwyn, your wife? Um, apparently she was on the same base. Apparently, but you never I, saw her I, or spoke to her. I saw her one time, right? Yeah. Ugh. And so from the time she got busted down um, to in, we had um, probably communication for about a, a month or so, or not, maybe even a couple weeks. Um, and then that completely cut off. And then when I got busted down months later and through the whole RPF, RPF, and into the RPF um, for a good year, um, I had no communication, couldn't, I was kept from seeing her. Wow. So I wasn't allowed to go in the dining hall until everybody was gone. I wasn't, because they were afraid that I would come and talk to her, which was really odd to me. Um, and one of the reasons why I got sent to the RPF was because I questioned Shelly about it, um, yeah. about suppressing communications, because that's a pretty clear no-no in Scientology period right <laughs> so, um, allegedly it speaks a lot to the change <laughs> well and it, it, that speaks to the you know idea that once you get in power you can almost rewrite the rules right. or somehow they don't apply and we did that a lot in flag like manning missions we would use a flag order when it suited us or an, an ouds or like an order of the day yeah. and even if we knew kind of policy would trump that and and reverse it we could get away with using the right policy to kind of get the product we wanted, right. which seemed kind of was encouraged by a lot of people. So it's, you know, it's really not hard to look back on and say, yeah, they, 
were easily changing policy because they felt justified in it. Right. Kind yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, I know. I mean, if you look, if you look historically over the years of Scientology, it has so drastically changed from, you know, and I'm not saying for better or for worse. It's just completely different. Like an auditor, right. somebody learning to do Scientology counseling today, uh, it's 100% a different process than what, you know, somebody in the oh 70s gosh, did, yeah. for example. Yeah. Or even somebody in the 80s. Like, it right. like it's, it is interesting how much it's evolved. And I, yeah, like I don't better or worse. I mean, I would say definitely worse because at least before it seemed like it was more private yeah and like because they didn't it wasn't everybody's like oh they record so it's like really since when because nobody yeah. ever recorded sessions ever it was never okay and yeah. then all of a sudden it's like everywhere he can look at sessions because he's the ultimate cs or you know case supervisor he knows yeah, and that's where that comes in is like you can justify anything if you think you're right enough yeah, you yes. that's, make mm. a really good point because um, at least from all the Hubbard writings that I read about recording sessions, it was purely as a training tool to make sure that the counselor, the auditor, was doing the right thing. Then it turned right. into they're recorded all the time, no matter what. And I think it turned more into a control and paranoia mechanism not a training mechanism anymore. Would you agree with well, that? No, absolutely. It did because what people were, con I mean, it's almost like a double-edged sword. Thank God they're recording it, but the fact that they suppress those recordings of people that are omitting crimes or co like, you know, um, admission of the commission of crimes, yeah. then yeah, that's ridiculous. Like I, the most ethical, it, it's just crazy how that gets twisted into, like you say, a control mechanism rather than, you know, anything else. And so I don't, I don't think it, um, it gives me like a pass because I woke up and like got out, but I think it speaks to that ebb and flow of like, I didn't really come from that kind of sign. I grew up with the sign taught the mission network yeah. and class four orgs, <laughs> not yeah. class, four, you know, and like those, that and that not that that makes it better you know i'm sure there was no. still a lot of but at the same time it was more grassroots and it was more um i i think people didn't like respect or um encourage people for being like total pieces of crap like now where it's like now i got you you know like can you imagine like like somebody like john travolta that maybe came out in session i i um was assigned to him a few times at the Fort Harrison. Mm -hmm. Super nice, sweet guy, but you could tell he was uncomfortable in his skin because he wasn't able to be who he was. Yeah, and he, you could see that that control was exerted over somebody who he just likes guys, and that doesn't make him a different human being. No, it's like, not at it, all. Unless he's an asshole or he abuses people, <laughs> then he's a piece of crap either way. But just because he like it shouldn't be used as this you know control mechanism so exactly yeah and it there shouldn't it be is. an expectation for him to become somebody that he isn't <laughs> right right and then you're in this servitude and you have to toe the line and say the right thing and give the right money or you know you it's alluded to that you what you don't want that's private will be gotten out by something that you know it's leveraging it's basic yeah. narcissistic you know triangulation and like, yeah, i have this info completely. you don't want it and like what you... so and yeah so kind of everybody so yeah no you're right so so for what length of time was it total that you and bronwyn were at the same property and yet you never were allowed to talk to her um it was a good year um that we were on the Int Pro and I was at mostly at Happy Valley or exclusively that's where I stayed, but I worked at the Int base every day. We were bust in to yeah. fix like that's when the gym was being built and all the walkways and all the underground wire lighting and low voltage you know lighting was being done. So yeah. everything was but, and, done, and by the gym wrapped up. By the gym you mean the the little Cine studio building, right? Not not an yeah, actual the one, gym. Well no it, when we when we built it, it had a boxing ring in it. Um, it had a what, sorry? A boxing ring. 
Really? And I've it, never heard yeah. that. Um, yeah, and uh Sterling was there. He should he would probably be able to confirm that. Um, but it was, yeah, we finished it. Was, I had to do some plumbing in the bathroom. There's like a one, a single bathroom in it. Um, and it was just, I don't know if it ended up being a workout, but I, I was, when I did it, it was referred to as the gym. Okay. So, and where was um, that? That was that way down on the south side of the property? Yeah, on the south side of the property, um, kind of by, there was like a, it was like near where the, it wasn't, I don't think it was where you did the running program, but there was a circular sand area. Yep. Um, and so it was just, it would have been just to the east of that, I guess, a little bit southeast of that, I would okay. say. Okay. I know where you're talking about. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, okay. So, so then, so then what happened? Like you haven't talked to Bronwyn. So, so how, how did this, like what happened next? Well, I kind of had my attention on it a little bit <laughs> um, because we never had any fight. Like we were, like we never, we were pretty copacetic. Like we were pretty good. Um, yeah. And until I abandoned her, but <laughs> well. that's always a bad thing. Um, but yeah, I, I would, I kind of have my attention on it. So I would be working, but always kind of looking around to see who, because at that point I, I had figured out or somebody let me know that she was expediting uh, under RTC. So she had gotten through whatever program and, she hadn't been assigned to gold yet, I guess. So she was kind of in that limbo state. And um, an expediting so, meaning just kind of being that's when you're just running errands and kind of your people are deciding what she's like position Shelley's you're, communicator. Right. right? Yes, Isn't that, yes. <laughs> that's the, yep. that's the thing that's like, that's where they say, you know, DM has this huge um, group of people around him. Well, those yep. are the kind of other people that are, fit you know willing to do anything they can't screw up in that situation because if you do that you know that is too gruesome to confront you will be yeah. completely so those are great people to use because they're great little soldiers you yeah. know yep. um, hindsight again 2020 but yeah so i ended up i ended up finally seeing her across the street <laughs> and we were out i think we were out on the road working on the on the gardening but on the south side so I saw her and I ran across the street to the north side and ran up to her while she was walking across the grass. Um, and she saw me and ran and ran over. And we like, I was like, oh, my God, how are you doing? And it, it was um, I kind of thought she was really mad at me, to be honest with you. Um, and before, had, before you saw her in person. Yeah, because we hadn't yeah. communicated and not, right. nothing that I had written or birthday cards that I had sent or anything had um, been returned or, or even acknowledged. Yeah. So um, when I saw her, she was like, no, no, everything's fine. Just get through the program or like, oh my God, or whatever. And I don't know what she had been told about me or, you know, like none of that even crossed my mind at the time. I was just like, are you okay? I miss you. I, I love you. I care about you, you know? Yeah. And um, he's like, just get through it. We'll be fine. And I was like, okay. And it, for some reason, I was just like, it was like kind of like when you're on the RPF and you first get there. And, and I guess like for me or for anybody like in RTC or anything, you know, that's a pretty big fall from grace. Right. Like yeah. you're doing stuff like I'm building storage facilities that are going to house the technology that's going to save mankind for at least a thousand years. And then the next day I'm on the decks cleaning out old Sea Org trunks. <laughs> you right. know, it's just like, it's a really hard pill. And, and when you know, that's like, look, my, like, look inside my head. My, I'm not counter intention. Like I'm right. not, I didn't like if if there was something to happen like we can this is work we can sort this out right right <laughs> you know? yeah but yeah and you, and you're we, right the the level of humiliation and just kind of you know undermine of everything you've accomplished that hits when you are assigned to the rehabilitation project force now you're you're it's not even I don't I don't think it's even fair to say it's persona non grata I mean yes it is a little bit of that but it's like now you're expected to 
uh, walk back anything, anything that you ever thought about yourself and rebuild yourself spiritually, so to speak, right. to make you a better person. Right. Like thinking about that anyway. Yeah. Obviously we can not going to get well, off on a tangent. It's interesting because when I was back at Florida, like really most of the auditing actions that most of the younger kids or the messengers were doing was all FPRD on like every dynamic. Right. Which, which is, is false FPRD purpose is false purpose rundown. rundown. Right. And each dynamic being the eight dynamics of existence. And yeah. And know, by like, false, and, we don't mean false. We mean evil purposes. Evil. Right. 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 <laughs> it's right. Not, it comes, <laughs> false sounds way better. But yeah, it's like, what, all, what yeah. are all the bad things you did in every lifetime on every subject of possibility of life? You know, they couldn't um, they couldn't call it EPRD because that would be confused with EP and phenomena. <laughs> right and exactly wait that's a, i want to do that one yeah can, in phenomena rundown like perfect we're done right. um so that's and the rpf is really similar like you start doing like on multi-dynamics and you do fall it's like almost the same and i'm like wait i was doing this as a messenger uh you know with it's just so strange how it's such a priority to clear the planet and there's not enough time in the day, but yet everybody can be RPF and it's more important to make an example out of people that are, you know, working their butts off. Right. So yeah, it's, it's humiliating. It's, um, and not even from an ego point of view, it's like, no, we're the ones like we sign the contract, you know, we, we are the ones that are pulling up our bootstraps. We are the ones that are, you know, taking on that estimation of effort and yeah. you know it's like it, it's strange to be treated um in that manner you know yeah so. yeah no it, as, as i'm listening to you speak it occurs to me it's uh, it's almost like an incredible infliction of psychological trauma such that um it, you know it's it's inverted and it makes you as a person fight harder to stay in and do better and us, you know, completely victim shame yourself right. and assume it all rather than getting the heck out of there. It's weird. <laughs> well, and, it's, and that's what's strange is like the, you know, if you look at Scientology, it's basically that projection. And like mm -hmm. if, you know, right now it's through the filter of David Miscavige, right? And and how he projects his fear and his trauma growing up. You know, I mean, it's hard. You know, when you, I was talking to somebody the other day about trauma and like when you're you're forced to acknowledge and look at your trauma in a way and that's kind of what the rpf does is like it it makes you it creates a wound and then it forces you to examine that wound when really all you want to do is look away and put a band-aid on it you know you don't want to and you have to sit there and keep looking at this wound that was self-inflicted or inflicted by somebody you thought was on the same team as you yep and it, it's you know, when we leave with those traumas, it's hard to then decipher those, you know, when the real world, they don't even understand what you're, why would somebody trauma, like in a religion, like you deal with all these things that you had no idea were these huge buttons in society Yeah, that you don't talk about and people don't talk about. Like it's yeah. a religion and it's legit. You're the one that's bad. It's like, wait a second, wait, what? <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. like, okay, <laughs> uh, you're right, I guess. And the one to stay because what if it is the only technology? Yeah. What if it is the real answer to save man? Then what? And that's, you know, that's the mystery sandwich or what keeps you kind of there. But we all, believe, as children, we were taught that. Like, it's like, here's what a mind is. Right. Here's what, you know, like, and you just, it's hard to unthink that. Even right. when you're sitting there in a boiler suit, dirty, not, you know, like, it's just, it's, you still rely on those basic fundamentals of like, man is basically good. Right. You know, and you think, yeah, no, you know, you're absolutely like right. That, that so. programming was installed for you and I, for example, well before uh, we were consenting adults and had fully formed brains. It right. was just part no, of the, the brick and mortar that made up our lives. Right. You knew file clerk, you knew, like you recall, you, you know, you don't remember, you recall you, yeah, yeah. it's all those little things and you Stop don't even dramatizing. Think of it. Don't be banky, right. you know, all the right. language layer upon layer upon layer that just, we knew what it was. It was like you've said before, 
Scientology was our first language as children. And we literally would be able to, I mean, I don't, speaking for myself, I had to learn to speak regular English when I was in a public school. I'm still terrible at it. <laughs> <laughs> I still speak broken English at best. No, I, you're I, I doing a great job. Purpose, but, you know, it's, it's, yeah. um, I think dissecting that is really hard. Yeah. Um, but, it, but as, and as hard as it is, it's very important, I think. Like, even just recently, just as an example, take the word blow, you know, an unauthorized departure. Mm -hmm. And yet the reason I very specifically and I believe more accurately now use the word escape is because blow, the word blow by Hubbard has built into it that the only reason you would be departing without authorization mm -hmm. is that you've done something wrong. You've done something to the group. And you're right? there That's for, the, yeah. right. You see what I'm saying? Like the, it's mm -hmm. built into the word itself that you're right. a bad person and the only reason you're doing what you're doing is because you've committed crimes do you see what i'm saying right well and it's it's that's the even the blow drill is people going because they're justified in saying look we know better than you because you've done something and it's like they're putting in those like the whole idea of scientology ethics and morals yep they don't they look at it like you know they they basically get the idea right but morals are subjective ethics are objective yep and in scientology it's like well you keep your own morals in or the group will put the ethics in and it's like well like that's kind of how society works but it's not like that we all have you know stated expectations and we have you know it's not just like you it's like it's basically you know what i figured out later is that it's a it's a trap set there for any like control mechanisms it's for any narcissist to take and to utilize to enslave and to trap people in their own just spinning around in their own head yeah and, and it's not you know and if, and if it could be used for good and most of the stuff that was really good was kind of plagiarized from other places right and most <laughs> of the you know and that and it's you know you can't take credit for a basic communication cycle although he does right. but you can you know like of course two people feel better if they talk about stuff and they come to an understanding that's and they and they human. listen and acknowledge right. yeah let that acknowledge not cause distance effect intention yeah. attention yeah. right it's you know broken down to and then it's all a distraction to get you to learn you know and it, it's unraveling that later it's hard to decipher what what was good when you don't have like i can't just throw it all away and start yeah. over you're so right i gotta take you, you know, make me realize so. too the amount of programming that normalized accepting what we were told at mm -hmm. face value with no no right. evaluation no no questioning don't ask any critical questions you know like our critical thinking capacity was literally disabled by scientology oh, was, as children totally yeah it was yeah. it not even disabled it was completely sabotaged yeah you know yeah. like every day i remember every god it was like two or three times a week in the mission they would have intro lectures and stuff where they'd be like okay make a picture of a cat make another mm -hmm. picture of a cat okay throw it away okay make another and you do and, <laughs> and you do oh, what that. about like, what about this part too close your eyes do you right, see the picture of right. the cat yes great okay that means everything we say is true or you know the pinch exactly. test on the e-meter you know on and on right. and on layer upon layer Ugh. yeah and that's yeah so it's those little things that like seem harmless but they yeah. set you up and indoctrinate you or make you susceptible it's like grooming like yes. right they said they make you susceptible to what comes like trs you know the the route for most kids used to be like okay do your basic trs then do your upper indox yeah and, and really you're yeah, like we're well, talking what do about I the do training for? routines the communication right drills. all the ones that yes. mitch and, and mark are going through yes exactly you know? yeah yeah and it's like you know you're sitting there and it's it's weird to sit there and put intention on objects and but as a child you're doing it because it's like what you understand and you know and maybe we are better communicators to some degree because we're able to have attention and we're able to like give people space if we use it in a, a positive way but that has nothing to do with scientology 
Right. You know, just as the indoctrination. Or maybe, like, or maybe we're good communicators because we always intended to work better to try and communicate with other people. And we've lived through some really hard shit, excuse my language. <laughs> right, right. I don't know. Yeah, I know. Who knows? But but okay, so since we're since I know you and I both have a hard out for today, let's mm -hmm. get back to so you so <laughs> Bronwyn. So you see her for the first time in like a year, even though you've been at the same property, you're both in the C organization. She tells you everything's gonna be okay. And for the first right. time, you realize she's not pissed off with you or mad, mad at you or anything else. She probably wasn't even receiving your communications, I would guess. So what, tell, tell, tell me what happens next. Well, you know, nothing happens for a couple of days. So I'm go do the same RPF routine. And then um, it was like two days later. I get called by the RPF MAA. And I was like, you know what? Okay. Hi, or thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, and they show me this knowledge report. And it was written by Bronwyn that I had originated communication to her. Oh, come and on. So it was, um, and I got assigned conditions. And I got taken off normal RPF stuff, and I got put like almost back in the RPF's RPF. Um, and and sorry, just to inter interject for a moment, because I know you and I both understand this mechanism very very well. But when you're in, when you're doing the rehabilitation project force, you are not allowed to uh, originate any communication to somebody not on that program. So therefore, right. Bronwyn, your wife, wrote a report on you because you reached out to her and talked to her and had a conversation with her after not having seen her for a year. Well, and let me give you an example of what that is. Yeah. This is originating communication to somebody. Right, exactly. Just <laughs> saying, hello. Part. Just right. looking at somebody is originating communication. Right. So you're not really allowed to gaze or to make eye contact with anyone. You're not definitely not allowed to speak and originate anything verbally, but yeah. you're you're also not allowed to really get in the way of anyone. You're not allowed. It's it's uh, it's you're not allowed to be a human at that point. Is kind yeah. of, and even with um, you know, it, that's where for me it, it was like it was almost an instant decision, probably based a lot on fear. But I had to leave. I see. And at that point. I felt completely and utterly unsafe. Like I felt that there was no way that any of this was going to work out good. <laughs> and um, so at that yeah, point and, I started. And that makes sense because that was so contrary to what Bronwyn, your wife had said to you in that conversation, right? That must've been a complete right. betrayal. It, it was, and, and it was a betrayal of everything I knew. It, it was like all at once, everything kind of crumbled down. Like all Scientology just sort of fell to the ground because it was like, wait a minute, suppressing communication. You know, you're right. It's It just, it goes against your dynamics. It goes against everything I learned. To suppress one of your dynamics is so destructive. Like all eight dynamics is what you're supposed to have. That's That's what as Scientologists as I grew up was you're supposed to nurture all of your dynamics. Right. And if you leave any out, you you have chaos, you have trouble in your life. That's not. And, and so to be in this position of where we were and what we were representing, and even at the end base, which I even like held in esteem kind of over CST, you know, like mm -hmm. it wasn't the end bases where they were running Scientology. Right. So, it, you know, it was like, that's what was, <clears throat> so for that to be so off basic tenets of the church, it it was just in that moment, I, I, I guess I only wish that I um, would have been able to see Bronwyn again and see if like, ask, I, I don't know, I hear all these stories of people leaving and, you know, where they, you know, person came after, you know, and it, it's it's hard to dissect that because you know 
you know, right now Bronwyn is still a gold. She's the gold receptionist. Her mom and dad are at the Hacienda Gardens, sick. In, in Clearwater, they're not able Florida. to work anymore. Yeah, they're they're in like a basic hospice situation. Um, they were on the ship, like not that that matter, but in in this context, it matters. They were they are part of the people that have given their lives, right, decades, like, their entire... entire, and their children, <clears throat> and like and they're comp- they're going to die alone in the at the Hacienda Gardens with no like. You know, I mean, that Mike Brown thing with his mother was amazing to see that there can be some closure. Yeah. You know, and um, but it, it's so sad to think about all the people that are gone and missing. And, you know, like even um, I, I've always felt a lot, a little bit of animosity. Um, and I know this is passionate to you, um, is the where is Shelly thing, because there's so many people that I knew that have been forgotten I and know. are missing. And, yeah. and I know it's not, I know you have to, you have to find a person and I know Leah was a great stepping, you know, stone for that or, but it, it's though, hard to. Yeah, no, though I, I am, know. I will be concluding the where is Shelly episode, uh, series with talking about the many other people missing. Yeah, the Isaacsons and right. like, and there's so the Mark many. Gagers, the Norman Mark Norman Sparky do- died yes. alone. Not that he was a saint, no. but like that was so, that should never, ever happen. That's right. You know, if there's somebody to love those people, they should be able to see them before they die. Yeah. Like, and why, why would Scientology prevent that? Why? Right. For what purpose? Well, yeah. Exactly. And that speaks to fear and that speaks to, you know, a, a leader that was, um, and not not to give any outs, but somebody who was abused as a child, somebody who might be born bad, um, which is a possibility. That's a thing with D- if you do look at any DNA research, there's a 50 percent chance um, if some people have certain DNA that they could be a psychopath. Yeah. Um, although a lot of the research says you have to have a pretty crappy upbringing, but you can check that box for DM. He was yep. called. You know, little or little Hitler and Enrique and, 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 Enrique Theta, and Theta, and Theta, yeah. And it's like people laugh <clears throat> about that, but do you, you know, as a second generation, I, I want to be, res- I want to be understood as a child, and then we yeah. laugh about another second generation that was treated like shit, and and it's and, hard. And, and I know in, that I'm just like, <laughs> no, no, but and factor in that any child that grew up in Scientology has been denied the very basic uh, foundational blocks of education, a real education. Right. right. Completely. Right. And, or have it stunted mid, which isn't, you know, right when we get to those formative years, yep. um, we're stuck in the Sea Org, which is basically, here's how to be a megalomaniac narcissist. Like it, right. Scientology is the ultimate I religion. It's all about the individual. Yep. And it's all about exchange. It's how that individual you decide to do, and it's under your intent. It's like the ultimate, you know, medicine man sales kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so that's you get somebody who's already looking for another father figure, you know, but that maybe mimics his current father figure, and boom, there you go. You got this ultimate guide of like, hey, if you tweak the policies in this way, you can really screw some people's lives up. And right. and it, it's um it's terrible. It's yeah. um I, I yeah I don't want to segue off too far, but no, um, that's even okay. that Ted Koppel interview was um you know if you go back and look at that, you you really get a good idea of the mindset of someone who's now not afraid to be a little abused child. Right. And it's yeah. like everybody's going to be everybody's going to get punished and everybody's yeah. going to get projected on. And you know, you put it's it's scary. That's how that's how psychopaths are made. And yeah. I uh, the only reason why I feel even able to speak about that is because I can parallel my life a lot. If I had had those opportunities, I I I could have been that person and mm-hmm. I could have not been that person. Right. And but I had a lot of the same. I was in Florida. I was in action. I would, you know, I I was similar age when I was in those places. And so I can see how somebody could 
look at those things, even as a messenger, even as somebody who at 14 years old, I had the captain of the flag service or calling me, sir. I yeah. had Mick Davies, the captain of flag crew, calling me sir. Somebody yeah. on the ship with LRH, you know. Right. It's like, so top, it's top, top, like top twenty executives in Scientology, and as you're a fourteen year old messenger, you are senior to them. Right. I'm an emissary. Yeah. I am. What I'm doing or saying is being done or said by the commodore. That's what we had to embrace. Right. So it's a fall from grace, but also you can see when you're there. If you never have to leave that pillar, yeah, like that's why I say my story is pillar. You know, parallel is I ended up at CST. I ended up above DM basically, right? Technically, but not really yeah. because he ran everything <laughs> micromanaging. <laughs> so yeah, you know, for it, sure, it, it it was that idea of like you know we were when we got up to that level we got treated better and we got treated. It's like oh I get it, like yeah, you know, and that's and it wouldn't have been like that, you know, if some other people had done it i think it would have been more um you know less cruel still yeah. bad but less cruel you yeah. know who knows so. but but okay so you so you decide you're out of there so what happens next um complete lack of planning is is what happens um and so i pretty much when we were going through um all the stuff i had my sea org ring Okay. Um, and that's pretty much all I had. And so after I got through the ethics cycle, because I was being made to sleep under the um, RPF MAA's desk. Oh, my God. At that, when that happened, because I was a security threat, because I wanted to be, at that point, I was like, well, just route me out, I guess. You know, like, put me on the leaving staff routing form. And, you know, even though I know the purpose is to keep me in, just put me on it. And. I know I can get through it, you know, <laughs> uh, but that wasn't going to be an option. So um, I did the conditions. Um, I I wrote what I needed to write in order to get back into a normal situation. And the first night they put me back, even but even a normal situation was we. I was still separated with. At that point, there was I think two other people from CST that had made it to the RPF. Okay. Um, so we were together as a little group. Um, and so the first night I got put back in that situation, um, I escaped. I got up in the middle of the night and I ran away. And this was from Happy Valley? Uh-huh. Okay. It was from way in the back where Stacy Von Young had been stuck. So it was like a hundred yard, a couple hundred yards from the main house. Um, and then you left from there. So... Wow. And so what time of year was this? Um, it was like fall, like September-ish, okay. you know. So um, walk me through that. How did how the heck did you I mean, I because I've heard of other people escaping from there. It's my understanding it's challenging to put it mildly. Yeah, I ran through the river. I ran through the creek bed. Um Lara just did a thing not too long ago where she did some video of the creek and i was like well, yes. i ran right through there i was right wow. through there <laughs> and so i planned it where um i was pretty sure nobody would i would basically have about an hour and a half or two hours yeah before i started being missed sort of thing yeah um so i ran all the way into hemet um and which how many dark, miles was it, that like approximately gosh I, you know maybe four or maybe six i don't i mean at the time you're like once you do <laughs> once you decide to get up i don't know how many people have seen the movie train spotting <laughs> but when i saw that movie i i literally almost had a like a heart attack um because at the end of the movie they had stolen a bunch of money and they're all sleeping. And the, this one guy gets up and grabs the bag and sneaks out and bails on everybody. Mm -hmm. And it just, it was like that feeling. It was that, you know, there's no coming back from this. And at the time, I had no idea about if you le blow the ant base, you get declared. And I, I didn't know any of that. Yeah. Um, there's a lot I didn't know, actually. 
So, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a lot we all didn't know collectively right, yeah. either. We were little in itty bitty islands many times. Yeah. And pretty ignorant, like pretty, yeah. it was, you know, hard to swallow a lot of that. But, um, yeah. so I ran to him at, and I found um, there was a Denny's and there was a little laundromat right across the street from the Denny's. And um, the Denny's wasn't open yet, but the laundromat was. Okay. And so I I went by where I thought was a city bus because my goal was to get to Beaumont because um, I knew there was a Greyhound bus station there. Okay. How I knew some of this stuff, I, I'm not, I could not tell you, <laughs> but um, I don't know if it was from driving, but I did a lot of just free driving when I was at CST. Like I could go anywhere I wanted. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so, funny though, in, in probably in retrospect, I don't know that your brain just kind of pockets pieces of information right, that when you're yeah, exactly. in that fight and flight mode, you have a plan. <laughs> yeah. Well, my plan was just to leave. I had nobody yeah. to leave. My dad's still teaching at Delphi yeah. like right now. Yeah. So he hasn't done changed anything other than he did, you know, declare or uh, disconnected from me as soon as he possibly could. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, hats off to you. I can't even the, the courage to just get the heck out of there. Like for me, I guess, comparatively, I was escaping to reunite with Mark, which is while it's very unusual, I knew who I was going to. Of course, right, right. similarly, all my family that I grew up with are still in Scientology. Um, but, right. you know, it's it, I don't know, I guess in that moment when I was trying to figure things out and I'm curious to hear your thoughts, I just felt that complete level of betrayal in that I wanted to escape. And I knew I could not turn to my mother, my family, because they would just turn around and turn me back in. Right. Well, it was pretty much, you know, hey, your only terminal is the IJC. Mm -hmm. You need to make it right with him. Right. Like, and that was it. And I was like, what? Did you, <laughs> you actually know, have I mean, that guess... conversation with your dad? I did. Um, months after or like a couple months. It's right when I pretty much um, ended up um, with nothing. Like wow. I, I so I had about a month or so. But he, so I left, when I left, I got, um, I, I went to the laundromat and that's when, um, Jackson and PK and a few other people came on their dirt bikes looking. Um, and so I, as soon as Denny's opened, I walked into Denny's and kind of sat down and hid that way and found, had found out the bus schedule. Um, and as soon as the bus pulled up, I ran out and jumped on the bus um, I got to Beaumont and I had, I think I had like $2 or something. Um, so I went and found a, uh, pawn shop and pawned my sea org ring. Oh, I, and I had see. no ID. I had no, I had nothing like this guy took, I don't know if like, those were always things I looked back on. I was like, why would that guy, he didn't, like I could have stolen it. I, he must have seen that before, is what I kind of figured. He probably saw somebody in all black stuff with like, "Here's a bracelet." Can I yeah. promise? You know, <laughs> best, like, I need best to not be asking any questions, right? Right. How much did they give you and for that ring, by the way? I think it was like seventy-five bucks or fifty oh, okay. bucks or something like that. So, because apparently it was gold, I don't know. Yeah, but. Um, he probably got a great deal and I got a bus ticket and lunch and that's really all that mattered at that point. So, um, they, I, I bought my bus ticket and then hid like a couple blocks away. Like at that point it was like at that, it was, um, my mindset was survive. Like it was, yeah. don't get caught. That was yeah. all that, um, mattered to me was to not get caught. Failure so. is not an option, right? That's I know I had that when when I was escaping. I was like, if I fail, my life, for all intents and purposes, well, will be over. How much worse could it get? Like I can't even imagine. Like this was pre the hole. This was pre like I was at the worst punishment possible. Right. So leaving from that, and then I don't know what. Like who knows? I mean, it probably would have been not as bad as I thought. Like I probably would have just been sent to pack and had to, you know, do more 
conditions, you know, same stuff. But at the time it felt like, oh my God, this is life or death. Yeah. You know, and it, and it felt like that for a, a bit for sure. Um, so yeah, I took a bus. Um, I got a bus ticket back to Northern California and, you know, not having been there in seven years and not knowing anyone and, you know, all my family that were in were in, <laughs> so they weren't. So it was, yeah, it was a, um, it was an interesting, interesting experience as far as, you know, what do you do once, once everything starts to land, you don't, you know, it's like, holy crap, what am I doing? Right. <laughs> you know, where do I go? How do I eat? What do I, you know, so it becomes, um, it becomes pretty dire straits pretty fast. And, and you have to kind of like, um, just, you know, cope and do whatever, you know, you can. Um, that was like the first time I ever really stole anything. And, um, oh you know, those kind of things where it was either, you know, you get so hungry, you have to either go steal something or you have to like, and then that becomes this whole guilt process of feeling guilty and feeling like a piece of crap because you know you you just were in the most ethical group on the planet technically and or at least i still believed that right and then i you know it was almost it almost it, it almost validated that it's they're crazy out here and they'll never help you oh wow. you know and everybody's like this sucks so then it becomes you know you're you're trying to find places that are safe and you're trying to find places where you know how what when does the library close or when you know how long can i stay here before somebody harasses me or how can you know and there was um my first landing spot was youth hostels um because they were like 10 bucks a night or you know and you didn't i i i didn't talk a lot for a while i just would kind of get my thing find my bunk lay down and you know because I, you don't know how to interact. So a right. lot of people would assume that you're foreign or you don't know how to speak English and you just, so it's easy just to not say anything. Um, and it's, so, it's yeah, devastating that you, you had no family safety net, no, no help. I mean, the fact that you survived is a miracle, frankly. Yeah. Well, I had, there was about a 20, 15 day period that I, I went to my aunt that um, had never really been in. Um, she had taken a couple co courses, but at, at a mission, you know, up in like South Lake Tahoe or whatever. So it wasn't so, she was sort of more acceptable for a very short period of time. Um, but at the same time, when I look back at that like small window that I maybe had, I was so numb. I wasn't even capable of being like, I'm not okay. I was still in that mode of like, no, I, you know, uh, you know, what happened? Well, I, I left and, uh, you know, you don't know what to say. And then people yeah. look at you, well, what are you hiding? Well, why aren't you saying? And it's like, well, at the time I, I wasn't capable. I didn't know how to articulate that situation. You know, yeah. and, and actually I really, I, I still don't know how to fully articulate that, you know, it's, it's yeah. that, um, but that was, that felt safe for a very short period of time. And, and so what happened with that? Though. Sorry. What happened with that aunt that, um, well, she was like, it was a couple weeks and she was like, I think she had talked to my dad a couple of times. Um, and she kind of finally came up to me. and was like, look, you need to get a job. You need to do that. And she just kind of gave me the, you know, you can't stay here. You need to get a job. Oh, wow. And so, and I was like, okay. So I went and tried to go fill out an application somewhere. And I was like, I don't like, I was, yeah. I was running multi-million dollar projects. <laughs> don't call them. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. like, what do you, Oh and my so gosh. Sit there and I would go to an interview because I knew that if I didn't do that, I would get kicked out of where I was living. So, right. I oh. finally concluded one day that that was happening anyway. So when I walked out of her door, um, I walked into the streets That's wow. and I started living, you know, um, on benches and under trees and bridges and anywhere you could, you know, you'd find clicks of people 
and it would seem okay for it'd be like a really cool high like everybody be like oh my god like you know every this is so great and then you know somebody'd start doing crazy drugs or you know yeah. there'd be a violence or somebody would get stabbed or um and so i would end up like blowing again like leaving that's just like, totally not confronting it and and running away yeah um and, and you and were so 27 up, by this time oh gosh no i was like 20 three oh um, okay i'm sorry i don't know why i had that wrong yeah. i i just wow um, oh the devastation of scientology on your life i'm really sorry dylan well no i mean it's you know it's still kind of there that's kind of why i keep f making it full circle back is that um it i don't want to I don't want my pain and my trauma to be so much that it controls who I am. Right. I want to be able to go into that area and talk about it and, and, and re, you know, embrace it because it's part of who I am. And, yeah. and, and even like being homeless, um, it helped me to heal from being in the church. It helped me. And not that I wanted to, <laughs> by any right. means. um, it forced me. And yeah. it forced me to look at things in this life or death. You know, I, I spent a good year making final points in my life. Like, I'm going to get on this train and I'm not going to get off. And something would happen, right? Like, or like, I remember one time, and I, I know we're, we're both on a hard stop. Yeah. Um, it was when uh, Whitney Houston, one of her songs, I think, I Believe the Children Are Our Future. Um, and I heard, like, I woke up that morning and I was, um, I was like behind a building, like in an alley. And I woke up and it was one of those outside malls that had Muzak in them, like the speakers along the outside of the mall or whatever. Yeah. And so I heard, it was like in the Muzak front, you know, and it was like, no, 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 no. And that, it was really, and I was like, and that was just super down. Like I was super like, why am I even alive? Like, what even, you know, thinking back on being in Scientology and and all this purpose to, you know, the, just being a degraded being. And um, I was like, that's it. I'm I'm done. I, I don't want to be here. I want to I want to finish this life. And um, I I walked down the mall and I I got on this bus, and you could usually steal. Or like find transfers <laughs> around bus stops. Oh, so like tickets. Transfer. I see. Uh huh. So somebody wouldn't like they'd use their ticket or they'd throw it and they'd have a transfer on it, so you could find a transfer and usually find a bus, you know, so you could wow. get around. Um, and I made it down to the train station, and um, I I don't know why I always thought about that was the best place to like kind of be done was on a train or like I guess you could jump off or I don't know. Um, <clears throat> But then that song was in the train station and it wasn't a music song. It was like her singing. Yeah. And then I got on the train. I still like, I, I still wasn't I, um, happy <laughs> with anything. Um, and I was on the train and I was sitting there thinking about like, okay, this only is going to go so far. Like I'm only have a couple hours and then that's it. I'm like, I'm not getting off this train. Um, and I sat down next to somebody and in their Walkman, they were playing the same song. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I was just like, and I really was like, holy. and this wasn't a time where you could go on the internet and, you know, like download the song and, um, and being like, kind of like growing up in the eighties, like songs to me, lyrics were like, you get a cassette tape or a, a CD and you're like li looking at all the lyrics. And yes. so I, you know, those songs, it's like with Mark and Depeche Mode, like, yeah. Um, you used to buy, know, I, I was, I buy the magazine and find the lyrics of the song and right. try to and memorize learn them. every <laughs> word and right. Incorporate them into um, everything. And I was determined to incorporate a Depeche Mode line into this, uh, but I haven't. So <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll do that um, on the, we'll do do that on our, on our next um when when we do when on our next part or collaboration or our parenting thing whatever whatever comes right, next right. i would love to to talk more with you and can i just say i'm 
so grateful you survived. I'm really sorry that you had to live through such hardship, but thank you for persisting. And thank you, Whitney Houston, for grabbing you that day. <laughs> yeah, that was that day was definitely it kind of gives you like you can find hope anywhere. You know, you just have yeah. to be receptive to it. And even when you're, you know, dead set on being depressed and saying this is it, I can't, I just can't take it anymore. I just can't. You know, like I don't want to, I don't want to steal to eat. I don't want to like, you know, lie to get to take a shower. I don't want to, like, I just don't want to do that anymore. It's just too hard, you know? Um, it makes it hard to be a good, feel like a good person. Yeah. You know, you're already declared, you're already disconnected. Everybody already thinks you're, and then you're there proving it to them, you know? So it makes it like a really hard um thing to get out of um yeah. no and, and that is it wasn't obvious. easy and by any means i haven't made it and that's why i'm still talking yeah is um it's still it it almost hurts more for the people that hurt and aren't able to communicate it than it does like i understand that pain but i know it sucks I, but i feel like i kind of deserve it or i've i've been um you know it's something that it's it's just I don't want to see anyone else go through that. That's yeah. That's you do, you do not deserve that, Dylan. None of us did. Nobody should be in that position of being discarded by Scientology and just left to like to live through extreme hardship. That's just part of the injustice of Scientology. And and I'm just grateful for your strength and not only living through that, but also um, sharing your story. Um, it is so, so important. Every single voice in this, uh, world counts and every single experience counts. So I'm grateful to you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and it's, I know I'm, I, it's, I'm a try, I am doing my best to avoid it. <laughs> I talk like, but I, it, it needs, you know, I, I've always talked about Scientology and I, I always feel like I just bash on, um, my, how I grew up. Um, and you know, there's more to it than that. Like there's even this whole, the whole X thing, you know, it's, it's its own beast and, yeah. you know, there's all these factions. And unfortunately, a lot of us people that have dealt with a lot of trauma and haven't dealt with a lot of trauma are having to navigate these same dangerous waters. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's, I, I want to see us all come out unscathed and at least, alive you know yeah <laughs> so, i i, I think the end of... ship has already sailed but that's okay right. <laughs> we're, 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 we're have a good right. <laughs> awesome well, well, and well maybe leaning more into understanding each other yeah. and where we come you know and all facets the yes. net you know there's such a big faction of people that are just you know interested because it's an interesting topic but then they yeah. can relate to a lot of the people so yeah. you know having that that attachment to reality is huge, you know, at yeah. least for me, because it's like, wow, there is some normality there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, we're, yeah. I think we're finding, we're yeah, no, finding <laughs> peace, love, acceptance, and recovery, I think, is something that we certainly can all work towards, no doubt about it. Right. Yeah. Anyway, I agree. Awesome. Well, uh, again, we have a hard, hard out today for both of our parent roles. So yes, I, I just am so grateful for your time today, Dylan. I will look forward to our next talk and any closing words you'd like to end with? Um, just that I'm available. Um, I, I kind of want to be a source of uh, neutrality. I, I don't, I don't want to gravitate towards, you know, one side or another or get stuck in one camp um, and, and I honestly, I, I will only center myself to, um, try to impart knowledge or, or relate to something, but yes. I would love to, to have a lot more conversations in the middle so that we can all kind of gravitate more towards, you know, like, let's really define the bad people. Let's really start helping the wounded people. And even the wounded people need to realize that they're wounded and they might be coming off as like, you know, you, you, it's hard to save somebody from drowning because you'll get drowned yourself. Yes. So, you know, take those life preservers and realize that we're all really trying, you know, we really need to try to help each other. Very so definitely. That's, 
that's my purpose. <laughs> well said, Dylan. Sending love. And until next time, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.